from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome. I'm Val Damaris, the creator of the International Storytelling Center here at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. And I'd like to welcome each and every one of y'all to our latest presentation of our ongoing Benjamin Botkin Lecture Series. The Benjamin Series allows us to highlight the work of leading scholars in the disciplines of folklore, ethnomusicology, oral history and culture heritage, while enhancing the collections here at the American Folklife Center. For the center and the library, the Botkin lectures form an important facet of our acquisitions activities. Each lecture is videotaped and becomes part of the permanent collections here at the library. In addition, the lectures are later posted on webcast on the library's website, where they are available for viewing to internet patrons throughout the world. So now would be an excellent time to turn off your phones <laughs> so it don't come a permanent record in our archives. Thank you. Located in Jonesboro, Tennessee, the International Storytelling Center and its renowned Storytelling Festival were founded in 1973. And we are delighted to say that the center's records and historic record, record, recordings are now part of AFC's archive. As the person who oversees the AFC storytelling collections, and, are, and particularly as the person responsible for, pro, for processing the International Storytelling Center's collection, today I am especially pleased to introduce Kiran Sin Sera, who from since 2011 had been the International Storytelling Center's executive director. Kiran's diverse career history includes works such as an artist, curator, teacher, and he's, from, he's originally from the UK, where he developed a number of award-winning peace and conflict-based programs in British museums and cultural centers. His accomplishments include developing folk and faith-based programs at national museums in Scotland, and, create, and creating several high profile peace and conflict resolution initiatives, exploring issues such as religion, ethnic and secretarian conflicts in, South, in Scotland and Northern Ireland. In his other arts led projects, he has tackled such issues as poverty, gang violence and modern day slavery, working with refugees affected by war and persecution, including social marginalized people, such as migrant Roma communities. Kiran went on to lead the Helen Keller International Arts Award, especially disability arts of the Glasgow's creative UNESCO city of music. More recently, as a Rotary World Peace Fellow, he has focused on the folklore of, hum of homeless persons throughout the shelter community, exploring how to bring together an international development community with arts and culture. As a folklorist, he emphasizes his interest in the power of human creativity, arts, and social justice, and the notion of a truly multicultural society. Today, Mr. Cyril will be talking on the, trans the transformative power of storytelling, a, so a social force of social change. Please join me in welcoming Kiran Sin Sarah. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Valda. That, um, that's a great bio. Who wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> I know this is being recorded, so I've got a tissue because I've got an allergy, so I don't want to run and come sending this video to my dad back home. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. And I, before I start, I just want to start by, um, first of all, taking my hat off to the entire team at the American Folklife Center here at the Library of Congress and to wish you all a happy 40th birthday. <laughs> And it's also wonderful to be part of your story because it's also my 40th birthday next month. So I get to celebrate my birthday with you all. 
I'd like to start off with a quick show of hands. How many of you consider yourselves to be storytellers? Okay, great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Where my line of work, I'm inundated with stories all day, every day, and I love it. I believe passionately in the power that stories and storytelling have to bring peace, tolerance and understanding to our world. I believe that we are all storytellers because we are the stories of those that came after us, those that came before us. And we, as we all learn to listen, collaborate and engage and share our stories with each other, all of us have the ability to write our own storied script. All of us in, all of us in this room are carriers of stories. Stories are part of our DNA. We are all storytellers, hot-blooded believers in, what the, in the promises of what storytelling can bring. We are dreamers, disciples of tradition, past and present. We are artists, poets, administrators, curators and citizens, or like me, a H-1B resident alien. <laughs> but regardless of who we are or where we come from, we are all advocates of culture. My name is Kieran Singh and I'm the president of the International Storytelling Centre based in Jonesboro, Tennessee. But as you can probably tell by my accent, I'm not originally from Tennessee. I am in fact a newly adopted Tennessean, and before that a Rotary Peace Fellow based in North Carolina. Before that an adopted new Scot that made, lived and worked and made Scotland my home. And before that an English-born Sikh of British, Asian, Indian and African descent. Descended from Kampala and Tororo in Uganda, in Mombasa, Kenya, and the villages of Hisharpururki and Babasang Santesia in Punjab in Northern India. Now, if you're confused, try celebrating Christmas, Pesach, Eid or Diwali at my house. <laughs> I have been with the International Storytelling Centre actually since 2013. But my organisation's work began just over 40 years ago, when a local high school teacher called Jimmy Neil Smith decided he wanted to save a dying mountain town by creating an annual storytelling event that he boldly called the National Storytelling Festival. Now that was a pretty fancy name for something that was literally 60 people gathered around a wagon. The stages were hay bales, if you can believe it. But there was enough magic there to spark a movement and something my predecessor likes to call a storytelling revolution. A storytelling revolution, it kind of has a ring to it, doesn't it? Well, around the same time there were less quaint revolutions happening in other parts of the world. And one of them involved my own family. They lived in Uganda at the time, and in the summer of 1972, one year before the first festival in Jonesboro, and four years before I was born, there was an announcement on Ugandan public radio by the then dictator Idi Amin. And he declared that all Ugandan Asians had three months to leave the country or they'll all be executed. Now that meant around 50,000 people, including my family, had three months to flee the country. Many fled the borders. My family left for Britain. They couldn't carry much, but what they could carry was taken by robbers en route, to airport, en route to the airport. But having left behind all their possessions and the tropical heat of East Africa, they arrived in a small English town called Eastbourne in the middle of a British winter. And that was where I was born. As Ugandan refugees, my parents stood out. My father wore a bright red turban and a colourful African shirt, and my mother an even brighter red sari. Later, my dad told me about overhearing a kid tell her mum, after seeing my dad, look mum, aliens, <laughs> meaning aliens from outer space, and my dad still loves to tell that story. Now, for the most part, the vast majority of people were incredibly kind and welcoming to my family, but there were some that were not so welcoming. There was racism, and it existed in my small community, but as a kid, that's not how you think of it. I just knew it was hard to understand why I felt so different. Home was always a safe and familiar space, but whenever I had to leave the house, I felt like I had to be constantly on my guard. It was hard to concentrate at school, and sometimes I ended up causing trouble myself. But things started to change for me when my head teacher, in our weekly school assemblies, started to tell stories. Mr George was an older gentleman. He was white, pretty much like everyone else around me. He wore his tweed jacket and a kind face. And he told us folk tales and traditional stories from all over the world. And one of them really spoke to me. It was about a prince who gives up his worldly riches and goes out into the world to explore the world. And he takes two objects with him, a cup and a toothbrush. One day he looks out and sees a man break a twig from a tree and chewing it to release these juices that would clean his teeth. And he realised he didn't need his toothbrush anymore, so he threw it away. Another day he sees someone bent, do bent down by a river and cupping their hands together in the shape of a bowl to drink the water. 
So he threw his cup away as well, realizing he didn't need that either. Listening to that story, I began to observe a world in a different way. Not only did that story help to paint a picture of a world beyond what I already knew or understood around me, but it connected me to the idea that perhaps the world provides all the things that we need to live in it. That story turned my fear to hope and it helped me see the possibilities where before I'd seen the challenges. It helped me see my own family's difficult situation, the idea that my parents were showing up in an unfamiliar country with just nothing but the clothes on their back in a new way. They didn't need material things to connect to new people or have new experiences or to remember the old ones. And I began to understand myself, the world and my place in the world. And I started to see the outlines of the story that I wanted to see in the world and how I could make that happen. Hearing that folktale, it felt like Mr. George was speaking directly to me. And I expect other students in totally different situations felt the same way. But that's the magic of a good story. For me, these first stories allowed me to grapple with challenges then and for what lay ahead. Through story, I learned to channel anger, frustration and anxiety into injustice, at injustice and inequality, into forms of storied spoken word and as a slam artist. Because story is my tool, telling is my shield, my sword, my passion, my inspiration to write, to repeat, to shape, to understand what I've heard. When we look beyond divisions and labels in the societies we live in, when we think beyond borders and groups and allow ourselves to embrace the wider world, we become international citizens of the world and we start to refigure and reshape our stories with others. When I first started out in museums back in 2001, I met an education specialist that gave a talk at the museum I worked in, at the National Museum of Scotland, and he said, the best way to connect culture to the people was to break down the walls of the museum. Let material culture be free, he said, and let people come and take what rightfully belongs to them. Now, the idea resonated with me because here I was, a professional working in a major British cultural institution. We had objects, thousands of them, many contested objects, that could be argued as stolen, looted or acquired illegally. If the British Museum were to give back all of its objects like that, it would actually lose 10% of its collections. But this was my first job in a museum. My role as a curator of education was to help present Scotland to the world and the world to Scotland. But to be honest, what I was finding was that many British museums often convey imperial perspectives on British history. One such example was an exhibition called Teas and Tigers at the National Library of Scotland. Reading the intro panel, it described the largest uprising against British rule as the Indian Mutiny. As a person of colour and also a product of empire, what was my position on these issues? Whose side was I really on? And whose story do I help to tell? I knew for a fact that my ancestors were not mutineers or pirates. They were proud people who fought an unjust system and helped free India from British, including Scottish, occupation. And to at least 2.5 million, million people of British citizens with roots in South Asia, this was the first significant war of independence. What a museum should essentially do is to try to make sense of the world around us and lead us back outside with a greater or empathetic understanding of the world we live in. Not just our nation, but our changing world. It's amazing how personal paths and new directions and world events coincide. Soon after I started my role, the world changed. We sat round the TV and watched Twin Towers collapse. Soon after, a local mosque and a local synagogue were firebombed. Some people were trying to stamp out difference by attacking places of worship at the heart of community. Soon after, the curator of the Islamic collections and I received a letter from a gentleman from the Scottish Muslim community. Concerned about what was happening, he asked how we in the museum could respond. So we, could, so we took out the yellow pages and called every place of worship and set up meetings. We invited imams, priests, rabbis, Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, Sikhs, Buddhists and Baha'is. Six months later, a single event was created through a festival format to explore faith and belief and identity in the 21st century, where people of faith and secular tradition stood side by side and told their stories. Coptic Christians sang songs of resurrection in Arabic. Sikhs wore a Scottish Sikh tartan and performed traditional bhangra with Scottish bagpipes. And Jewish Scots performed music that combined Scottish, Celtic and Klezmer tradition. And in the way that humour and meaning often coexist, they named their band Celtica Schmeltica. <laughs> 
In that one single event on that day, six months after 9-11, 6,000 people of diverse faiths and backgrounds decided to come together, to stand shoulder to shoulder, to use arts, culture and personal storytelling as a powerful expression of community solidarity at such a time of difficulty. That experience helped me to realise that if you work in culture, in whatever position, you're a cultural diversity officer. It's not a choice, it's a responsibility. This realisation informed my work over the next few years and I was, as I was appointed as a public programmes curator for Glasgow City Museums and Culture Services, tasked to tackle social justice issues in a city that has one of the highest cluster of child poverty in Europe, 360 gangs, and where the average life expectancy for a man in the East End is just 55 years old. In a city within, within a nation riddled with complex, a complex history of sectarian and ethnic division. It's also, it also involved cultural connections through developing storytelling approaches to societies emerging from conflict with colleagues from Belfast and Northern Ireland as part of the peace and reconciliation process. I was a first generation immigrant leading a program that addressed the conflict between Protestants and Catholics, white on white violence. But as an outsider, as a brown, Asian, English born Sikh living in Scotland, of English, Indian and African descent, I was able to use storytelling and my own story to communicate the connections between racism I experienced as a kid to the sectarian divisions I was witnessing as an adult. Our projects evoked memories and used stories actively collected from people affected by the sectarian troubles. And when these participants, including individuals, communities and the wider culture sector, museums and libraries, arts organisations, with support from political leadership, began to invest and recognise the value of the storytelling process in healing community. We were able to collectively build an effective community model that has helped to envision a new 21st century identity. Not to ignore the past, but to reveal it in new ways and as part of a global community. These stories were the basis of connections and relationships with community leaders, ex-paramilitary groups, territorial gang members, politicians, police officers, people of all different faiths, to not only collect and tell stories, but to encourage them to tell theirs. What might be seen as a mundane, everyday story also offered powerful ways to explore and thread stories together, like the Scottish saying, there are many threads of this tartan. Enabled important discussions within a safe environment. Storytelling offers a search for the common ground and a place to find that important meeting space to allow people to seek freedom by starting with freeing our mind and igniting our imagination. Envisioning a world without conflict is hard to do. But through story we can paint a picture of a world for ourselves and for others that is possible. This is a process that can take place between two people, two communities or two countries. It can scale up, it can scale down. But this doesn't always mean it's easy. Using the arts takes a level of thick skin and conviction in our art form. The first time I tried to bring in two rival gangs in a museum space to share their stories, they broke out into an all-out fight with each other. But with commitment to building community, we tried again. And with specialist support from partners and city leaders we, that saw the full potential of storytelling, including social workers, community development officers, police officials, we developed ways in which fostered story-based relationships that continue to be used to this day in city-wide gang and, and peace and community reconciliation programs. Models that are now being shared in storied approaches in building peace in the Middle East between Arab, Israeli, Muslim, Christian and Jew. The approach was to see art, culture and creativity, the process of story making, not as a tool to conquer or divide, but instead as a way to heal, to come together, to form community, to have a voice to impart wisdom, sometimes ancient wisdom, through the tales we tell, to follow a belief that in fact we are all storytellers, it's just about what type of storyteller we want to be. And that humble approach led to big things. The programme we started is now recognised by UNESCO, the Scottish and Northern Ireland governments, and is now has had around 90,000 people that have participated in to tackle bigotry, sectarian and ethnic divisions, gang violence. It's recognised by Her Majesty's Inspectorate for Education. From the time when humans picked up coloured rocks and etched visual pictographs onto cave walls, to the day when NASA scientists inscribed a visual human story onto a pioneer space probe and sent it out into the universe, 
humans have told stories. Storytelling offers us a way to connect to other ways of life, to the organic world, with the forests, mountains and seas in which our tales take place, to the walls and libraries and corridors of our museums, our churches, our mosques, our synagogues and other places of worship. As a museum professional living in Scotland since 2001, my colleagues and I around 2004 were looking at how we could plan to mark the 2007 bicentenary year commemorating the abolition of the British slave trade. It was an important year, especially as I was now living in Glasgow, also known as the second city of the empire, but for whom many people did not realise was built on the back of transatlantic slavery. In 2004, I got to hear Lonnie Bunch, when we invited him to Scotland to speak at the UK-wide museums conference. At that time he was the president of the Chicago Historical Society and now of course the thinker behind the new African American museum being built on DC's museum wall. He said one cannot tackle racism without grappling with the legacies of slavery yet few want to actually discuss it. I was inspired by his words. I realized that as a person of color and as a product of empire that I was in a unique position to facilitate those discussions. I wanted to take what people think as two opposing sides of a conversation and put them into dialogue. Lonnie Bunch helped to spark an idea. We couldn't literally return these objects to their rightful owners, so we did the next best thing. Next best thing. An invitation went out to invite the members of the African diaspora to interpret these, those objects instead. Many of those objects from museum collections that had been historically or been collected and interpreted through only Western institutional Eurocentric structures. An African Voices exhibition sought to reinterpret these objects through first-person narratives of artists and poets and musicians, refugees and members of the 30,000 or so African Scottish diaspora community. The project itself was an attempt for some of us on the inside to relinquish institutional control by provoking diverse interpretations of the aesthetics of cultural property. This work challenged the idea of static culture and sought to utilise contemporary traditions drawn from African and Caribbean folk traditions, including developing a Glasgow, a Glasgow Haitian voodoo altar, a Rastafari reggae sound system, and the commissioning of new artworks for the museum collections on themes of products of slavery by working with artists of mixed British and African Caribbean heritage. Beth Ford was one of those artists that was commissioned to respond to the year-long programme. An artist of mixed Barbadian and British descent, she used her own body, her own story as someone of mixed heritage to explore herself as an artist, as a woman, as a legacy of slavery. Ford's installation, The Shadow of the Object, fell upon the ego, used photography and sculpture to explore identity and loss by enacting the experience of slavery as a violent suppression of identity. She created a series of powerful installations which included a masked self-portrait wearing a slave mask, taken from the museum's collections, originally used as a form of punishment. Ford described her artwork as symbolising the human cost of the slave trade and the prejudice that remains today. There was only so far we could go without breaking down the walls of the museum but we could utilise the museum as the object itself, as a cultural space to challenge racism and other forms of crimes against humanity. And how we could do that by unpacking how much of Scotland made its fortune on the back of what many referred to as tobacco slavery. By encouraging us and others to listen for what I believe is the most important cultural artefact for any museum, people. By incorporating diverse and uncomfortable stories and presenting how much of Scotland's empire was in fact built on the blood and sweat of people that were once enslaved and how that legacy remains with us today in various forms. As cultural advocates, as curators, as festival coordinators, as public administrators, it's vital that we gather and assemble people's stories to help our audience listen in new ways. As institutions of culture, it's important that we share history in all its multiplicity, not shape it into tiny narratives. Harnessing the power of storytelling to build a better world is not easy, but I believe it's an idea worth cultivating. We want to empower people all over the world to tell their stories and to hear about other people's stories, to really listen. Because when we think about it, it's an art where you don't need special equipment, or costumes, or anything really. And like Mr George's story had taught me as a kid in school, you don't even need a toothbrush or a cup, because the world provides you with everything you need.
In my work and in my life, I'm incredibly fortunate at the local level to go into schools and to help classrooms truly understand this country's remarkable cultural heritage and to work with healthcare providers to use story to connect with their patients and to help foster healing. On a global level, I get to work with key partners and collaborators to help spread that storytelling revolution. Places like the Smithsonian Institution, NASA, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Google Cultural Institute, the Desmond Tutu Peace Foundation and the United Nations, and many others. And to work with our friends here at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress to help preserve and digitize years worth of archives, to promote storytelling not only as a traditional folk art, but to further it as a contemporary practice. And through our connection with a network of Rotary World Peace Fellows, we get to support groups and communities around the globe, such as the indigenous communities of the Amazon, and help empower marginalized people to share their stories with the world. And why do we do that? We do it because stories matter. And I believe they matter a lot. Through storytelling and in my work, I've seen how we can give, if we, if we can, we give it a go, we can give precedence to historical accountability to offer healing and reconciliation to the oppressed and the afflicted in ways that open hearts of listeners and enable us to share and embrace social change and think about the connections between social justice, community building, activism and cross arts and cultural alliances. In my work I've seen how we can use storytelling to unravel some of our underlying societal challenges and the foundations for prejudice that exist today. How the voices of those sidelined sidelined from history refuse to conform to be beaten down by those with power over them. How the small but powerful defiant acts across time became work chants, quilt makers, folk tellers, graffiti artists that told visual stories on subway trains and was used to empower and form communities of their own. How those that managed to put ink to paper or how artists turned paper to pulp to those that scribed and scratched and carved story circles into rocks or circled rocks into sand, to those that turned stories from the margins of society and learned to play lead, lead guitar in a band and gifted the world with Delta, Mississippi or Chicago blues, the slam poet, the querido, the Appalachian ballad, the capoeira dance, the protest Sufi or Indian song. Because when we think about it, we cannot tackle racism without unpacking the legacies of slavery and oppression and our modern day institutions. When we think about it, we cannot tackle sexism without unravelling the way that gender has been told in the stories we've been told all our lives. When we think about it, we cannot tackle bigotry without looking at the stories of our historical shared and global past. And when we really think about it, we cannot tackle violations of universal human rights without listening to the stories of all those that have been stripped of their human dignity. One story from Ferguson, one story from Baltimore, one story from Charleston, South Carolina, pull these stories together, then collectively we shape the narrative. The narrative that builds the movement and ultimately use story to promote the idea that telling stories matter because the arc of the moral universe is long but bends towards justice. As one great civil rights leader that stood in 1963 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial once said, a leader that truly, a leader that truly knew the power of story to inspire change. Our stories help us as we refigure, reshape and redefine our flexible identities. Moving from place to place, city to city, country to country, to form new communities. When someone asks you what's your story, you can reply, which one? Because all of us stem from traditions that span thousands of years to rural beginnings. We all have stories to share, from the wisdom of folk and traditional tales that we carry from our families our tribes, our traditions, the stories that speak of 40,000 year old civilizations from Africa, Asia, Europe and other parts of the world, to the indigenous stories all across this nation, to the stories of this place. We have entered an era of conflict that is taking new forms and spreading in ways that are outstripping the power of the international community to respond. As ISIS spreads across the Middle East, and we've seen Ebola, Royal West Africa and conflict destabilize Ukraine. And here in the US, hate speech and its consequence effects causing harm to the idea of living in a harmonious society. As some of these factors harness the power of story to join young people into their dangerous ideology, it is clear that we, knew we need new conceptual lenses and creative approaches for how we can think about the way we can collectively build peace, mutual respect and understanding and prevent conflict from taking hold in our communities. So not to only reveal stories that matter, but also in places that matter, such as the many cultural arenas, such as museums and libraries, national storytelling festivals, that present the stories of who we are, where we come from, and importantly, 
where we're going. We can never underestimate the power of using our stories when we know that a world of peace comes from a state of empathy, a state of belonging, shared notions of joy, happiness and suffering, all of which are fundamentally part of the human condition. To deconstruct the stories that are destructive and enable us to transform stories into the constructive, even if in that very moment it's hard to see that potential. I've learnt, however, that sometimes in tragedy there are small seeds of hope that give rise to new stories of opportunity. After 9-11 in New York City, when all visits to visitor attractions declined, apart from one space, the Islamic galleries of the New York City Metropolitan Museum. Why? Because humans are curious beings. We want to seek out the truth for ourselves. We are smart because we have a desire to learn about cultures we hear about in the news, so that we may form our own opinions. That's why finding diverse and creative ways to embed stories in our, of our lives, of other people's lives, is important. And it's also why one of the most popular museums in this nation is the National Holocaust Museum. We don't go there to be entertained. We go there because we're trying to understand and grapple with the story of who we are as one human family. And how we as humans, on one hand, can be so incredibly destructive, but how we can also perhaps learn to shape our common dis human desire to live in a peaceful and conflict-free world. And that's part of the reason I wanted to share my story with you, because I think this work of telling stories is important at the level of the individual and not just the institution. I was born in England. My mother was born in Kenya. My father in India and my brother in Uganda. I have this long-time belief that not only is my family like a mini United Nations, but we are all storytellers. We keep the old traditions alive, but we are always finding new ones. From as long as I can remember, we have drawn from our experiences, our global traditions and cross-cultural thinking. Stories are always crossing borders. I've spent the first part of my career in Scotland and now here in the United States with my own stories and the stories I've inherited from my family. And there are many ways we can do that, through personal story, through folktale, pieces of history and other forms we haven't even thought of yet. The stories passed to me became my vehicle to know that love and hope will always conquer hate and that the business of the world's most ancient art form, storytelling, has the potential and power to make a difference if used wisely. I'm the proud son of refugees, but I'm also part of the immigrant community that has the great fortune to make England, Ireland, Spain, Scotland, North Carolina and now East Tennessee my home. But in the way we might craft for ourselves a sense of home, identity and belonging, in the ways we know how, we can also use our stories to reach our full artistic and creative potential to cross boundaries of ethnicity, race and social class, to listen to courage and voices vexed about a social apartheid, and use our stories to put the dream, desire and struggle of what it means to be human into words, to help us all build a collective, diverse and plural society that we all wish for. In December last year, I was in Washington DC, co-leading an arts and peace building program with one of our Smithsonian Institution partners. On my last full day there, I carved out some time to walk alone through this great city. It was quickly getting dark, but before moving to my final destination that evening, I took a moment to stand still on the Washington Monument Hill with the Lincoln Memorial behind me and the Capitol Hill way out in front. Streams of airplane dust lined the sky as I bent my neck backwards to get in a view of the emerging night sky. And I waited there until the sun began to set over these magnificent historic buildings. Another day like thousands of others of life and love that this city has been witness to. Standing there still and cold, I looked out at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, currently under construction, and I thought back to that speech in 2004. When I got to hear its founder, Lonnie Bunch, give that inspiring speech at a museum conference in Scotland. And I thought back to what he said about the value of using all our cultural spaces, all our peoples to help society unpack and wrestle with our societal challenges. Before I came to the United States, I had often thought that America's immigration story began at Ellis Island. This was at the forefront of what I'd been told and what I learnt. But after being in this country and having had a chance to listen and connect with others, I also know that for 40% of people that descend from enslaved people, an American story came through the ports of Charleston, South Carolina. 
Telling stories is not solely about a single place or a single tradition, but something that connects with something much more profound. It plays a crucial role in binding and helping communities to flourish. Things that are essential to help us understand how we can improve and better our world. Museums as the one under construction, I think, will help all of us to think about how a museum can help people not just hear new stories about American history, but hear the stories that already exist, that have often sat on the margins, and are thankfully, slowly but surely becoming part of mainstream culture and shaping the way that we think. Because diversity and true multiculturalism, after all, is about the integration of diverse ideas. We cannot change a narrative by ourselves, but by telling our stories we can contribute to a plurality of viewpoints to help build new narrative arcs that bend towards justice. By telling our stories as a force to shift our minds and excite our world, to challenge the status quo, and when necessary, kick up a good old mighty storm through a story. But most importantly, we can use storytelling to build bridges we need to do with others, with ourselves, and others that share beliefs in equality for all. I'm here today to share an important message, that each and every one of us is a storyteller. As storytellers we walk into the hot winds of the world and we pour our stories from the heart, from our blood, for the ones before us that poured their stories into us. We all have the opportunity to use our stories in big and small ways that are important. We can use them to connect with our families, our friends, our co-workers and our communities. We can use stories as a binding force whenever there is conflict in the world because we can all be the stories that we want to see in the world. And we can help others too, just by listening. Because the power of story will be with you wherever you go. Because when it comes down to it, to tell a story is an act of love that I believe matters to the world. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. How long was that? <laughs> so I'm actually... Um, sorry? Oh. So I'm actually um, very open to any questions that you might have. Please don't make them too difficult or use really long words. But I'm open to any questions. And it's really nice to see so many friends in the audience. We've got National Endowment for the Arts, Folk and Traditional Arts. We've got Smithsonian Institution. We've got Paddy from Journal of American Folklore. We've got folklorists and all sorts of people, and many of you, storytellers. So anything that goes, and open, ask anything. I'm not a US citizen, so I can leave any time, right? <laughs> <laughs> Danielle. Um, uh, she was my professor, by the way. <laughs> Karen, thanks for um, giving some sort of vignettes about different programs you've been involved in. It was really nice to hear about the ways that they um, emphasized and also illustrated complexity. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the storytelling program in Glasgow. Um, how was that structured on sort of a practical level? And what kinds of skills were you, were you teaching people skills? Were you just providing space? There was many different levels, and one of the things that um, I, I kind of I go I, I'm trying to fit this into a kind of good answer for you, but I'm also thinking about other things that when I first came to the country, there's an, a, a folklore leading folklore called Elaine Lawless, and she said to me once when I was like, "It's like you're in a very unique position because so many ethnographers and folklorists and anthropologists they go and study the minority group." African-American or Lithuanian-American or they go to other countries but who studies America who looks at America and as a person of color with this British accent it could, you can be in a position to use that skill to be able to facilitate so make sure you use it wisely and I think back to that because back in Scotland here I was British brown I wasn't Catholic or Protestant so when I first got into Glasgow the first thing I was on a subway train and people were singing the song um, hello, hello, we are the Billy Boys, surrender you or you'll die. Um, it's a sectarian song, it's an it's a anti-Catholic song. And I, but the thing I saw in everybody on that train was that people just kind of accepted, oh, it's them. And no, we don't accept it. And I think there was so much of an attitude for three million people that this is the way it is, it's the way it's always been, and we're just gonna have, we just have to put up with it. The first approach really was um, going out collecting. We did a lot of collecting. And I say some really unorthodox ways of collecting, going to the Glasgow Bower Markets, <laughs> going behind the counter and picking up the sectarian merchandise that the guy was selling. But he would only sell it as, like a scarf, a Celtic scarf that God's chosen people. 
or stuff that would be sectarian related about the IRA or the UDA, the paramilitaries. We collected these objects, but we also looked at, looked at song. Um, and some of the, the songs, the ballads that were used, for, such as Greenfields of France, which is a, a, an Irish song, an Irish folk song, talks about the Great War, not about the Troubles. So what it does do is a song that unites different communities that live across divisions, but many people not realising that it's sung in the pubs and the homes and the social gatherings. It's a song that unites cultural difference. By a, a number of series of collections, but I'd say a big, big part of that was city leadership. Because what had happened was um, Jack McConnell, who was the first minister at the time, a Protestant, married to a Catholic, Bridget McConnell, who was the leader of the culture and services for Glasgow. I knew that sectarianism was becoming a hot topic. People didn't know how to tackle it. My own institution was 80% Roman Catholic in a city with 26% Roman Catholics, 6% of Scotland. But it's historic, so it's seen as a sectarian institution. So how do we... But I knew it was becoming a topic that was going to get funding as well and political support. So it was about working with the Scottish government, building those connections, and also our city leadership. Um, Mark O'Neill, who was the head of the museums and gallery service, was a, was a forward thinker, he was an Irish man, so he was a forward thinker. And he employed many of us as community workers, social workers, education specialists, to get higher pay in the museum service, because we understood the connection between people and how to make the partnership of health organisations, community organisations. So rather than having just 14 museums, 46 libraries, we also had partnerships with health centres, community centres. So it's a much more strategic approach. When you had that backing, you allowed to take risks. Many of the different ways was setting up a programme. I, I, I talk about my own first experience was setting up a programme called Big Up Busters. Very simple, catchy name, marketing, good branding send it out there and it was really to enable teachers in Scotland to understand how to pack a, a new curriculum by looking at um, uh, citizenship, what that meant. And so I would reach out to Protestant based schools, uh, non-denominational schools, like Protestant schools and Catholic based schools and, um, and the football clubs, Rangers and Celtic, as well as education and work with them in a way that would take objects out to those schools and get projects where they would come as part of a visit. Every school had to kind of pay for their visit, but if you're a Catholic school and a Protestant school and you came on a joint visit, your trip was free, supported by the local government, to encourage that, foster that healing. Now, I started as a very simple school-based program, but then it expanded into a way where uh, Ulster Museum and some of the Northern Ireland counterparts would... Um, invite me or some colleagues to go over to Northern Ireland but as part of the peace and reconciliation process was the peace to money they had funding to support the peace process so we would contact leaders in the political departments in Northern Ireland the Northern Ireland Assembly and Community Relations and Ulster Museum that would put together groups that included ex-paramilitary groups IRA, UDA, police officials, army officers, government officials, the Ulster Unionist parties, the SDLP to come as a part of a group to come across the water to Glasgow. Because when they do that, they have something in common, their land. You can make that kind of space for conversation. And with that political support, using our museums as spaces to facilitate conversations. So that grew from a very simple program like that to programs where we, we unpacked, this, everyone, everyone um, agreed that sectarianism need to be tackled, but when it came down to unpacking the divisions, like, segregated schools or, or a marching culture, the, then we differed. So it was about unpacking those things that really matter to go into a deeper level and people sharing their stories. One such example, and I'm going to tell you one example, where a member of an, one of those people that came over was a member of the Orange Order. If you know anything about the Orange Order, it's the Protestant fraternity. It's seen as the 90,000 people walked, marched through the city of Glasgow and it's seen as Protestant victory and... Um, and they're, they're not liked by many people. But one member of the Orange Order came in that group and we had Roman Catholic members, we had people from the churches and faith. And he said to participate in that one day of dialogue, we had this sort of safe spaces created that he's doing it because Jesus is important to him and teaches him to love his neighbor. 
his faith is important to him. But when he goes back home, his entire church and community are going to disown him. I think that was, I mean, I think that was brave. And also because he, he was able to tell that in a way that was, it was authentic, it was true. It was his personal experience was about to happen. But he did it because of his brothers and sisters he sees. Um, so there was those kind of more closed off programs. There were also things like we brought in an exhibition that looked at 21st images of the KKK in the United States. And we brought that to Scotland. One of the reasons being that to let Scotland remember what you sent out. Because it was founded by, you know, that Scottish influence. Bring it back to Scotland. At the same time in 2005 was the cartoon images of the Prophet Muhammad that came out in the Danish news cartoons. I was contacted by a Danish school and said, well, how, you know, how are we going to, and Britain actually banned those images in, to be displayed. But city leadership said, if you want to do a discussion on this, you can use those images. We'll get, you know, we can bring it out, even though the Tony Blair banned the use of them. So we, we facilitated a, round, uh, a space where local Muslims, Iraqi Muslims, refugee Muslims could talk to those students and discuss what those images meant for them as Muslims, as Danish young people, and looked at the exhibition of KKK, what can happen when people use, um, promote ideas of race, racial ideology or racism through religion. There was many levels of that, and there was obviously much, much larger kind of programs where young kids were empowered to write five-point action plans on how to tackle sectarianism between Catholics and Protestant schools. And the kids became the kind of committee, and we would support them to write that letter and send it to the first minister of Scotland, demanding a response. Many, many other components, but the the, the 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 I think a lot of that process was because culture and art is seen at the forefront of how we can change our societies. One example being in Northern Ireland, where my colleagues they have um, in their collections poetry this big, written. On, uh, by Bobby Sands, the IRA hunger striker, when he was in Long Kesh prison, called Poetic Justice. It was sneaked out of the museum in a condom up someone's backside, but eventually got out of the museum. It stayed in the museum's collections for so many, many years until the peace process was kicked in in Derry. And what they could do, they could then put it on display, and then they can invite the community from both sides to come and interpret those objects. Not just that one, but other... There was a, um, a steering wheel that had a bullet through it. There were the dustbin trash cans that were used as signals in communities such as Derry when, when the, uh, the British Army were coming in and women would clamp on the trash cans and the men would go through underground tunnels and escape out to the mountains. By bringing in communities to interpret these exhibitions at a time where we can, the tensions are still there but there weren't violence then that was a good time to bring those discussions in. So those were kind of examples of many, many others. But I think very much we're having a very leftist, I guess, <laughs> Glasgow's very, I think, very progressive and has a, a good vision. They celebrate every year for the Douglas's birthday and Mandela Day and many, many other components. Go to Glasgow, you'll see what I mean. But, uh, but really taking social issues as the starting point rather than the object. Long answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> This work that you were engaged in already before you went to graduate school in folklore in Chapel Hill, uh, how did academic study in folklore influence your work? Do you know something? I have to be really, really honest. When I when I was doing work in the National Museum of Scotland, I came in as a teacher, as an artist. Um, I spent seven. I would work seven days a week. I would go and work in communities, and I and I, I had a museum's master's background um, and an education background and an art degree um, and I'd lived in Spain I'd, when I came in and then when I'd done all this work after 10, 12 years they said apply for the Rotary Peace Fellowship and it's by chance that the, the Rotary Peace Program was based at Duke and UNC but when my person that was inviting me to come be part of this scholarship based program because we think you should be in the folklore department I said well, what is folklore <laughs> and I actually didn't know I couldn't define I always thought I always thought that term oh it's storytelling it's stories you know and I had that kind of but now looking at obviously folklore from a much more deeper perspective and looking at 
when people say it is story, it is storytelling because it's the many diverse ways that we tell our stories. It's telling the world who we are, where we come from, whether that is your kilt, whether that is your food, your proverb, your your how however we put it out there. It's telling the world who we are, where we come from, and I would say that a lot of that. I d- it didn't as much. I did a lot of public reading. I read in the daily newspaper, you know, and I, um, and I, apart from maybe my maybe more my my museum theory, my museum background on on interpretation and um, those sort of components. How long are you gonna be here? <laughs> I'll be here till Friday or Saturday. Great. Then I'd like to invite you to our storytelling session on Capitol Hill. On Capitol Hill. Are you Karen? Is your name Karen? No, I'm You're Karen. <laughs> your daughter yes. said I must meet you. Okay. Yes, so we have a story. It's, it's five years old. Where every month we tell stories. We have a theme and people get together. And that's invite, open invitation to people? Oh, yes, yes. It's right at the center, at, at our community center on Capitol Hill, at the corner store. And on Saturday mornings, the children have their storytelling happy hour because we're trying to encourage. I'm the liaison for Washington from National Storytelling Network. Okay, perfect. Yes, Excellent. That's very good. Liaison. That'd be great. Last time I was on Capitol Hill, I was uh, doing poetry for an anti-fracking uh, demonstration. So, um, right. so it's right a great right place, to, great platform. So right. tomorrow at, in the evening... Okay, so come on. Perfect. You. Thank you so much. And for the rest of us, what time does it start? Se- uh, uh, <laughs> seven to eight. And you have wine and cheese. Have something to eat. Yeah. I like wine and cheese. <laughs> 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 okay. I wanted you to talk a little bit about your experiences at the International Storytelling Oh, yeah. How yeah. are you? With your vision and, and ideas about storytelling, how Jonesboro is not all that progressive, <laughs> I don't think, probably. Well, I think it's, I mean, I don't want to get into US politics, might be, but um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I mean I'm, I'm a brown dude from Europe. Um, I'm obviously progress. you know, I've come from a different mental, political spectrum, which, but, but I think it is progressive in a sense that there are people, they, there's a, a belief that the arts are important. They've invested in the arts as a catalyst. We talk about this cultural trend, creative placemaking, well, we've been doing it for 44 years. Because arts is a catalyst that has grown the community, provides jobs, supports an economic impact of $7.6 million to the local region. That's a pretty good creative placemaking case study, right? I think it's progressive also because there's history of progression, because don't forget the birthplace Right next to our building is the birthplace of the Emancipator, the America's first abolitionist newspaper, which I knew about in my work back in Scotland. And here it is. There's a history of various different types of progressions. You know, obviously, it's, um, the way underlying of the way politics is seen today is various ways of looking at it. But there's a, it's a very strong connection to values and community and connection, and I think that's very important. And I think there's a very good welcome of that. My work in, in the storytelling center. When I first started, I think there were there was a, a reach out to the National Storytelling Network that were invited to ask, what type of person would you like to see? Now, Jimmy Neil Smith, my predecessor and my friend, had org- founded the organization for and and uh, retired in 2010 for for 40 years. And they, they said they want someone to put the international into the International Storytelling Center. They want someone younger. They want a folklorist. Well, they got that. You know, they got a slam poet too. You know, and so where I see it is I'm not a U.S. citizen. So the way I think about we have an international responsibility. The things that I do, I charge every U.S. organization for my time. But I do that so we can do pro bono work in Rwanda, in South Africa in the Middle East, because that's part of our international responsibility. We have to share our resources. The sort of the work that we try and do is to build, before the Storytelling Center, I didn't know about it. So we have to build the type of strategic partnerships so people can be engaged. And I think that it's ultimately it's about when we can harness the power of story for a young person to cultivate how to use story in various different ways. So 
building partnerships with like the Google Cultural Institute so we can create video footage that goes out to 14 million social media followers to re-establish work with UN education, put peace at the heart of what we're doing, put community building at the heart of what we're doing and form the right type of partnerships. The right type of partnerships are when we're invited to go to Charleston, South Carolina to work with the victims and families following the massacre that took place in Charleston. The right type of partnerships is the Ferguson Commission, using stories to help promote healing and reconciliation. Working in Baltimore, working with communities on the grassroots level that are trying to use story to honor their ancestors, native cultures, African-American ancestry, to help bring more balance to America's story by working with partnerships that can help America to understand itself from the diverse ways that we can see one another. Those are very strategic. It's also about looking beyond the arts sector and working with the international development sector. I work a lot with the Peace Building, Alliance for Peace Building, in a way because we want to put storytelling as both a folk and traditional art form in many different ways, but put it at the heart of peace building work. So we're, we're doing programs here in DC, I'm with the Alliance for Peace Building this week, looking at story as a, as a counter-terrorism tool and building global strategies with civil society organization to empower and use story as a creative tool at the beginning of con conflict prevention and not part of conflict resolution. I put arts and creativity and culture and create and at the forefront of our thinking when we're building strategic partnerships, civil society across the world, so we can be smarter, we can draw from our traditions to alleviate conflict and prevent conflict from happening. So we're doing a lot of that type of work. And obviously reaching out to Silicon Valley for those investors. And I'm sure I'm doing I'm reaching out to Silicon Valley, I'm reaching out to the Ford Foundation and inviting people with lots of money to come and support what we do because you can't do what you do without money. So um, that's partly that, but you have to look at, and you know, corporate investments as well. So there's a lot of that and growing the festival in a way that make it meaningful for diverse ways of looking at ways stories can connect. So we invite slam poets, we invite the founders of slam, we invited Piper Kerman, the author of Orange is the New Black, Many older people won't know her, but many millenniums, millennials do, because she's a hit on 50 million viewers on Netflix. So we invite her to come and tell her personal story about what it's like to be incarcerated for a year. Doing LGBTQ-based stories, 9-11-based stories, and inviting, making sure that diversity and equality is at the forefront, on the front stages and never on the fringes. Diversity, equality is at the heart, at the forefront, and very visually out there because it sends a signal that if you're a national storytelling festival, you have to represent the nation, you know, and not just the Appalachian region. A lot of those type of work. Hi, Kira. Thanks hey, for, thanks Todd. For over. Um, you know, the, the, the American Folklife Center, the National Storytelling Center, we've been partners for a long time, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that you're, you're one of our one of our major partners. And, and I just wonder, in, in your kind of idealistic world, what would the how would that partnership look? How would how would we help to reflect the, the vision that you're bringing to the center? Thanks, thanks Todd. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I see it as a, you know, it's a great relationship and it's kind of like we're growing together and we're growing in line with the way the storytelling movement's growing too. Um, I see it as a way that I'd love to be able to find the grant to digitize the entire collection. When we digitize that in Kalaya collection, the way I see it is that we can help tell the story of the storytelling movement. Because if you've got all these collections from Ray Hicks and Catherine Windrum and Jackie Torrance and, you know, going back to Guy Carawan and Doc McConnell, Gamble Rogers, Pete Seeger, that are in your collections, once we digitize that collection, we can create ways to make public access. If we, every kid in America can get connected to the diverse tradition, the way the storytelling movement has changed from 73, much more, I guess, an interest in a personal narrative now. You can not, you can enter the moth and StoryCorps and all these great programs, then we can create public programs. And I, that's the, my interest is to really digitize those collections. But I also want to look at the way these, these collections can be used in ways to promote things like how do we grapple with climate change? Because I think a lot in a lot of those stories that we have from those, because they have so many of those folk tales and that draw from many different traditions and draw from diaspora traditions that a lot of these 
have content and wisdom that we can apply to when we're trying to grapple with migration and issues and climate change and conflict and war. And I love the international peacekeeping world, peace and stability world, to connect with this ancient wisdom because they are the libraries of our world. So I love to see that more, that, that type of collaboration. Obviously the commitment to public access is really important. Um, and if this Google partnership happens, I don't know if Nikki's here, but if this Google partnership, hello Nikki. So if the Google partnership that happens, then obviously we can help to digitize part of the print collection, which that's a great start because we can visually make this material more exciting. And obviously I think, um, uh, you know, drawing from the expertise of what you guys have um, and allowing more people to get access, not just here, but also across the world so people can see the story behind the story of what makes up America. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, up to you, Nancy. Why don't you take one, one, one or two more questions? Sure. I'll take one. Lady. Um, I'm kind of an amateur in learning about storytelling but I was just wondering if you have any suggestions of what the average person can do in their day-to-day -day life to uh, promote connection um, and engagement and, and what they can do with their personal stories, just in a, in a simple way. Mm, absolutely, I think that's a good question. Um, I think it's really important. I think sometimes um, when I do storytelling workshops, sometimes I don't start off the question, what's your story? Because suddenly you just get this kind of blank and you feel like you have to be really good. So you start off with a question, What's the moment that you started to think about the world in a different way? What was the happiest part of your life? When you go back home at Thanksgiving or you're with your, your loved one, you don't, you, you, you become the storyteller. And so going back to the moments that are important to you, and I always do a little meditation actually, close your eyes, in your mind go back to when you were young and paint the picture of what it looks like in standing in front of your house, of your home. Start describing the sky in, in if it was words or if you could taste it. Start going back into your imagination because all the content is there. Um, and I would think sometimes to start with those single moments, the moment that you, that's important to you that, um, that changed the way that you might think about a certain thing in life. Um, or, or experience, or a person you met, or an event, and use that as a starting place, and you start, just start exploring it, and use that as a starting place to start writing your story. Do you know I mean? And don't worry about it being all fully amazingly presented, you know, beginning, middle, and end type of ideas. Just start and see where it takes you. Other than that, there's a toolkit you can use, and I've got a toolkit called Telling Stories That Matter, on our website, International Storytelling Center, that looks at not just how you tell your own, how you can cultivate your own story, but how you can use it in community building work, how you can collect story with some ethics in there. And that's uh, about the importance of uh, when you're collecting stories, you know, some of those ethical rules I think we should be following. I hope that was helpful. Got two, sorry, I'll just lady, uh, Bill and, yeah. Oh, I. Oh, no. <laughs> Earlier on, you mentioned bringing two gangs together, and the first bringing them together resulted in a fight. Mm -hmm. You tried it again, and it, a fight didn't take place. So what did you do to keep the fight from breaking out the first time, and what did you hope to achieve? Well, yeah, I mean, the idea is because what happened in, in Glasgow is very territorial. And it's, it's pocketed with Catholics and Protestants, Catholics and Protestants, but they were sectarian. And the reason, we, the reason we wanted to do that together is because a lot of these young groups, around 12 and 13 years old, um, they would die for their friends. This, that family unit that they create in those groups, territorial, you could be GYT, Govan Hill Young Team, and you mark your, but you won't go across the street because that's, a, that's the, but inside those groups you've got, Rangers supporters and uh, Celtic supporters, the Catholics and Protestants. So it's kind of like the time where we can unpack what sectarianism means in the city before they become, they start going to football games with their dad and to different pubs. So the idea was to unpack that friendship and unpack when you hear that sect, using those um, 
what does that mean for them? So what, the, the reason why it kicked off as a fight in the first time is because we didn't have enough of us. We didn't have enough of the social work staff. There was too many in the group. And uh, something happened between one of those young people that it, it, there was a lot of tension inside that young man that it, it resulted in a conflict. The next time we do it, I sought the advice from social workers. They are the specialists when it comes to those young. They understood their lives. They could describe what was going on in what was going on. We reduced the number of the group and we increased some social work and we just planned it better. And we did it again. Um, one of the things that we did is the restorative justice program was a program where if a young person commits a first time offence, usually what they do, I asked the police officer, what do you do? We said, well, we get them to paint the train station or whatever just do community service. I said, well, send them to me. So they started coming to me in a museum and working on three months residencies with artists. I got artists, textile artists, poets, and all sorts of people. And they thought they'd be punished, but what they're doing is creating a, an exhibition. And some of these exhibitions would have GYT, that vernacular form of graffiti you find in Glasgow, and turn it into anti-sectarian or anti-racism messages. And we'll display that alongside Salvador Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross the most famous painting in Scotland. When a young person sees their, their artwork displayed alongside this most important painting, they realize, well, it's basically saying society loves you and society cares about you and your voice matters. When you start to cultivate your own story, you start to love yourself. When you love yourself, you can love others. So those are types of programs that we did but it was very much about one-to-one -one small group work for a, long, a lot of that it was very intense but bringing in other specialists you're a specialist in one area but others recognize other people have specialisms and drawing from that specialism i'm sorry well yeah last one and then yeah just so, yes It's my kilt. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I, I had a question about African voices, about the exhibit. Diversity is an incredibly diverse idea. Diaspora mm -hmm. is a diverse idea. And I heard you talking about Africans, people of African uh, descent from all over diaspora. But I didn't hear very much about Africans, diasporic Africans, here, from here, you know, those who had come, whose people had come through the enslaved experience. And I just wondered if the African Voices exhibit included those voices as well, because often we are considered not diasporic. No, I yeah. I don't know where they think we came from, but. Yeah. <laughs> it, did, it did in the sense, but maybe because such a large portion of the black population in Britain is Caribbean. So Guyana and Jamaica and all the Caribbean islands. So a very large population in Scotland, across Scotland, is the Caribbean, African-Caribbean population. So we did, Beth Ford was African-Caribbean. Um, but during that time, there's many, many projects that we did. And we looked at transatlantic slavery. We looked at the products that came into Glasgow. We looked at the tobacco lords, because most of the tobacco that came from this part of the world, Americas, came to Glasgow, Glasgow made its fortune, distributed across Europe with other products, you know, coming into Liverpool or Hull or Bristol. But the part of that was also looking, um, looking at, say, Robert Burns, when Robert Burns was asked to be a plantation owner, then came to, he refused and wrote The Slave's Lament. So we looked at Scottish heroes, but looked at it from that perspective. So it invited people to, and artists to interpret that stuff from various different perspectives but we did look at the life of you know leading abolitionists like frederick Douglass. you know um there were some loose connections with boston and things like that but it was primarily looking at within britain and those british colonies and and but i i i, I agree i don't think there was probably as much as that within the united states next time yeah next time next time <laughs> thank you yeah. yeah thank you so much yeah thank you thank you all thank you, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.